Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. It's your pal, Jeremy. Hi. Uh, a lot of you guys don't know me. Um, I just got in yesterday. Uh, but I run the digital division for the Discovery Channel in Los Angeles. Uh, and I'm running this really cool program where I call all of our viewers on the telephone and I sell them videos for $100 a piece. <laughs> I'm, I'm messing with you. Uh, actually, what I do is uh, I run all of the comedy and topical verticals that we have in LA. I work with Phil DeFranco, SourceFed, People be like, I have a sketch comedy channel called Nuclear Family. Uh, and I've been there about a year. Um, like Ryan, I actually got a very interesting lesson in the power of the influencer economy many years ago when I worked at MySpace. Uh, and I worked in the music department, and I noticed that there were a lot of bands that I had never heard of, and in some cases had never played a show before, that had more listens, more fans, and we're selling more merch than bands that I obviously had heard of. So you've got people like Hollywood Undead and Jeffree Star outselling uh, U2 and System of a Down, which was a popular band at the time. Uh, and that really resonated with me. I realized that there was a lot of power in being authentic uh, and having platforms upon which you could build your product and find other people that belong to whatever particular niche you happen to be in. Um, to give a little bit of context about the type of content that uh, we produce in my shop, I have a, uh, an upfront presentation that we made for Discovery's uh, upfront that I'm going to play. And then I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, the ways in which I uh, approach creative development. And hopefully, um, some of that will be interesting to you guys. So I'll play this. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Let's just jump straight into it. A Florida man married his own tongue this weekend. At least he can't talk back. I want to die real bad. <laughs> Warner Brothers announced the actor who'll play The Flash in the Justice League movie. Say no more. Ooh, boy. We're doomed. We're all doomed. If you don't think we are, it's probably because you haven't looked up from your iPhone in like 12 years. Life is like a bowl of cereal. Easy to make it, but I don't want to have to be the one that cleans it up. Come on, it was just a parody, seriously. It's not like we used a real gun. Well, it was a real gun. Yeah, but there weren't any bullets in it. Hey, the sketch looks great, guys. What sketch? So I'd love to know what you think about the news today, but of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love your faces, and I'll see you next time. All right, Jeremy, this is very cool. So oh, thank you. get us started. Where does your development start? Uh, well, um, where I usually have to begin is considering the audience. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about influencers, I'm talking about a few different people. There are people like the celebrities that work with Jash. Mm -hmm. There are people like Phil DeFranco, who you saw there, that have 4 million subscribers. They've been on YouTube a long time. Uh, and there are people that are up and coming that maybe have 50 to 1,000 followers, maybe no followers at all. So you're starting with the audiences of those influencers? Uh, yeah, in many okay. cases, uh, you really have to consider that because every one of these people that's creating content is creating content that is to them authentic and every one of their followers uh, is viewing them as somebody that's relatable and aspirational, somebody that they can uh, emulate. Uh, a lot of people aspire to also make content. Uh, I think everybody, uh, for the most part, somewhere deep within them has a creative expression that they want to get out. And now that we have platforms like uh, YouTube and Facebook and, and Vine and Snapchat and all these different ways in which you can do it, even if it's just Twitter, uh, there are so many options and there are so many ways for you to reach a community of like-minded people. So that's always where it begins uh, with the authenticity. And that's something that uh, became very much uh, ingrained in my production process mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in my time at Machinima. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with Machinima uh, but Machinima is a company where I was the creative director for five years. We did a lot of big projects that you might have heard of, like the official 
uh, Halo series and Mortal Kombat series, a lot of video game stuff. Uh, while I was there, my team and I produced over a billion views worth of content, uh, basically because we were huge dorks. And we spent our entire teenage years, instead of playing sports and having friends, playing video games, and that's just what we knew. So that's what we made. We made wacky game jokes for kids. We made and silly cartoons drove, about it. They drove billions of views you're talking Turns about. Turns out there are millions and billions of other people who <laughs> waste their time playing video games for 40 hours a week. Uh, so yeah, that, uh, that really inspired me to think, uh, okay, so if, if this whole community exists here, and if it's really that powerful, you know, how can I, how can I take it to the next level? And uh, discovery is really interesting um, because there's a little bit more of an element beyond just the commercialization of it. Uh, there's also the sort of positive message uh, mm. and the educational element of it on top of the comedy. So we use comedy as the Trojan horse with which to introduce big ideas and you know, topics that I think some of the, the, the younger millennial audience would like typically avoid, if that makes sense. Yeah, and so at the heart of what you're talking about is this authentic voice, right? Having these influencers. Um, and then you're developing programming around them that would best be suited for their audiences. Okay, so so far very straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, we've talked a lot about platforms, and one platform that I've heard very little about is YouTube. Yeah. Right? And this is a platform that we know we can monetize. Right. This is a platform that in some ways has become very predictable in how we grow on it and how we develop programming for it. That continues to be your top platform, correct? Yeah, that's interesting that, that it hasn't been discussed more because you know, as interesting as some of these other platforms are, uh, there's no denying that YouTube has always been a, a top performer uh, and YouTube has a great experience and it is a social media platform in and of itself. And I think that's something that a lot of people overlook is that there are people that hang out on YouTube. Uh, there are people that engage with YouTube every day. Uh, and it's one of the top places where people search for things. So if you know how to manipulate SEO in any way, shape, or form, and you have some idea what's going on in the cultural zeitgeist of the youth, which you, you can't possibly miss because they never stop talking about it on all these other platforms, mm -hmm. you have all of the information at your fingertips, and YouTube is really great about having the analytics to know who's watching, how long they're watching, mm -hmm. being really transparent about you know, what they're viewing uh, and valuing in terms of how the algorithm works. For example, you know, watch time, everybody knows, for the most part, watch time is really important. Uh, obviously, short form videos do really great, but sometimes you have but to have some longer form short videos. Form? Like what do you five minutes. All right, so yeah. that's still people given Snapchat and Vine and Instagram, right? People would consider those and the auto playing on, uh, on yeah. Facebook and the 30 seconds and all that. People would consider that long for digital, right? Thinking three to five minutes? Well, yeah, because every platform is different. You have to understand how your audience is consuming the content on there. Uh, Facebook is doing something that YouTube was doing years ago with auto-playing, and you know, you see a lot of people doing those, those text videos, right? Like the Now This videos, we do it. Uh, SourceFed and Seeker do it. Everybody mm -hmm. does it um, because it works. Uh, but once everybody knows that it works, you should be looking at the next thing. You should be experimenting with the next thing. Uh, because the audience interest will shift according to how much saturation that they're receiving. Right. Um, and that's, that's one thing that, that YouTube has had a lot of experience with because it's been around a little bit longer. We've already tried nearly everything, or at least you think you might, but then something else comes along. For example, uh, we've recently been experimenting with 360 and VR videos. Have you, mm -hmm. Has anybody seen any of these kind of videos? Mm -hmm. uh, personally, I'm a big fan of the 360 video experience because you can just take out your phone and it doesn't require that you have a headset attached to your face. You can just kind of look around like this or you can scroll around on your browser. Uh, actually, it works on Facebook now too. Um, but you know, two years ago, it just didn't exist. So, you know, it just creates a new opportunity to tell stories and to make content and to be creative in a new way. And you know, two years ago, three years ago, it was putting VFX in videos. The Freddie Wong, Punisher, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, Bat in the Sun, all those guys that were doing these really cool action videos with special effects. That was pretty much unheard of, but that was, that was creative people uh, looking at something that they found interesting that there was not enough of out there and having the tools with which to do it. Before that, right. it was even having digital cameras. Got it. Uh, so as someone who is so fluent in YouTube, 
right? And being at a media company that is very fluent in television, yeah. right? And getting to then develop programming that sits or extends these, these TV shows, what happens to the programming when you are moving it to YouTube? Or when you're creating content for YouTube that is connected to those programs, how does it change? What do you have to think about to make it work for YouTube? Because we all know you take TV clips, you throw them on YouTube, does not work. Right. right? You, you can't take television programming and put it there. So what do you have to do to make it YouTube programming? So to be, to be a successful creative person, I think you really need to understand uh, style and tone. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim and Eric, who you guys were talking about before, is a great example of that. They have a very specific style and tone. If you're familiar with them, you know what their style and tone is. Mm -hmm. That same idea holds true for pretty much any property. Uh, an example being uh, Naked and Afraid, which is a show that we recently did an activation with, right? So we did a version where we sent the source-fed hosts who, you know, each of them has 100,000 followers on multiple different platforms, so they do have a built-in audience, and we do this, this programming where we do kind of originals. Uh, and we actually did a source-fed version of Naked and Afraid. Using those influencers. Yes. Using those people. All right, yeah. so let, let me make it difficult for you. You don't have access to those influencers. You don't have them yet. You're a content brand. You haven't developed influencers yet. You want to develop programming and be committed to YouTube to extend your programming. Where do you start? You hire them, Paul. <laughs> like, there's millions of them. Like, they, like, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting, a, you know, influencers. That's what I'm, what I'm telling you. Like, the, the younger audience. Well, that's great. Good. The younger audience, their self-worth is numerically represented by how many Facebook fans they have and Twitter followers and all this other stuff, right? Like, there is no shortage of them. I think you just need to be open to it. And you need to understand the strengths and weaknesses that come along with that. So do you hire them? And I want to really get in the nitty gritty here because you know <laughs> this. This is a great opportunity. Do you hire them to just appear in your content and put it on your channel? Do you create content with them that lives on their channel? Do you make stuff that just lives on, you know, or do you just start making your own? Well, let's, let's use the example of a brand, right? Okay. Now, uh, what you don't want to do is go out and make advertainment because the, the audience is going to be like, oh, you're trying to pass off a commercial mm -hmm. as, enter as entertainment. And I know it's just a commercial, right? It has to actually be content. Uh, you have to know what your style and tone is. You have to understand your platform, and you have to understand the audience on that platform. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't make the same video for television as I would make for YouTube, as I would make for Facebook, as I would make for Vine. They would all be different. And in fact, all of the programming that we do across all of those platforms is different. There are a lot of people that would say, oh, you could just take an article and you can like turn it into a video and upload that and that'll be fine. Or you, know, you could do like a social cut down of something on YouTube and you could put that elsewhere and that will be fine. Uh, but all of my analytics show that that is not the case, that you have to, you have to respect the way in which people are consuming content, mm -hmm. who's, who's consuming the content, what those demographics are. You know what works, what isn't, and where the gaps are. Right. So, so you tell the full story in the edits that you put there. You don't just cut down and for the length. You actually tell the full story when you can. Right. You. Um, you know the trick of it now is you can't just be an artist, which is, you know, maybe some people can, and and it works for some people. Uh, and I wish I could tell you the secret to that. I think it's it happens by miracle. You know that that a true artist would be able to like build a huge following just out of nowhere. Uh, I think it requires a little bit more of an entertainer spectrum and maybe even an entrepreneur spectrum. So you've got your artist, your entertainer, and, and your entrepreneur. You have to sort of be able to see all of the sides of that and how that works together. You have to understand the analytics. You have to understand the psychology of the people that you're making the content for. And you have to have the instincts and, and talent to actually make good content. So if I, like for example, if I was gonna put uh, a, a YouTuber or a Vine star into uh, a show or a movie or something. I might not put them into a big budget, you know, high profile movie right away. I might do like a Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen type movie, mm. right? Something with, with you know, mid-tier expectations or- A crappy movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's good for who's watching it, sure, right? Sure, sure. Like the, those things make money. They, they're economically right. viable, people like them. Uh, and, you know, you ha sometimes you have to kind of take a step back and say, you know, am I doing this for, Am I doing this for my personal enjoyment, or am I doing it out of respect for the audience that's watching it? Mm, right? You have to. It. You have to. Sometimes it doesn't. Your input is is valuable, but it's not the whole story. You have to. You have to be willing to uh, give a little bit of uh, the control to the audience because it, it really all the control is in their hands. Excellent. Well, Jeremy, listen, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Thank you for Jeremy. Thanks a lot, guys. Excellent.